Uh, I would like to uh, make an announcement and also a reminder. Thursday, we're going to have a uh, handout for the guidelines for the second paper. If you plan to leave town early, be sure to have a way of getting uh, a copy of that uh, so you will be able to think about some of the issues uh, during uh, spring recess. Also a reminder that uh, the Mandarin session is going to be held Wednesday afternoon at 2, from 2 to 3, 2 or 3, Van Sur. For those who are interested, uh, I welcome you to come. And uh, it's not an obligation. You can come in and leave any way you see fit. The topic today is uh, sincerity. But I would like to begin with uh, a comment. I think the time is uh, perhaps overdue about the method of this course. In most of the other courses you take here, there's normally a clear sense of uh, progression. We start with some very simple ideas or statements or mathematical calculations that move to more complex. The procedure is quite clear and the expectations are obvious if not uh, precisely defined. So you always know where you are in terms of the development of the course. For this course, uh, not all the courses in moral reasoning, for this course, uh, the process is, uh, sec is uh, circular. It's like a circle. It's not a progression, very clearly defined. And there is building, but at the same time I would call it digging. You cannot say that the analex is easy to understand. Once you master the analex, then it's easy for you to read Mencius, Xunzi, and all the other ideas. There's some core values, and we urge you to try to make connections. Of course, the underlying thesis is that to animate the old in order to attend the new, which means we urge you to return to some of the early issues and problems in the analects and mentions as we move ahead, and ask you to make connections. Implicit in this method is unavoidable, I think unavoidable repetition. The same issues will be visited again and again. But hopefully when we visit that same issue, we have some new insight, new understanding, rather than simply the repetition of the old. So many of the issues will be discussed time and time again, almost like a circle. But if you feel it's simply horizontal, there's something basically wrong. Of course, not just you, wrong with the lectures, wrong with the sections, wrong with the readings. But what we would like to see is a kind of uh, synergism that will eventually emerge. So when you begin, when you first heard the idea of self-cultivation, you have some vague idea what it means. But as you move along, you have a much more refined, even critical understanding what it means. The psychology of uncertainty in this kind of uh, course is unavoidable. Not only for you, but for all the uh, section leaders and especially for me. For example, whenever I approach a, approach a lecture, I always feel very nervous. And even though I've been involved in this uh, four or five times, but every time it's, uh, it's a new challenge to me. But for you, I think the number of exercises that are critical, reading, listening, thinking, questioning, discussion, or discussing. If you don't read the text very conscientiously, try to get the nuance, you will not get much out of, the, out of these texts. They are bad letters. You have to breathe vitality into them. Listening too, you may be able to see, well, the guide is not making any sense at all. But don't judge uh, prematurely wait and see whether it's really the case. If it's really the case, you have to develop a kind of a critical understanding of what some of the problems are involved. Thinking. It's very important to exercise your own reflection, thinking about some of those issues. If, never, if you've never formulated a question, 
if not a burning question, but an important question that you want to ask your section leaders or ask me, there's something basically wrong with either your approach or the way of reading it. You have to be able to formulate challenging questions. If you haven't been engaged in any discussion with anyone, friends, relatives, uh, debating partners, enemies, concerning some of these issues, there's something basically wrong. At least you should have at least one experience of engaging in someone discussing, debating on some of those issues. Lo reading, listening, studying alone in this course is uh, not going to be very edifying. And then, of course, the whole question of dialogue or conversation. The more you'll be able to involve in small group conversation or dialogue discussions, the more you open up to all kinds of possibilities. You'll be surprised how much there is that uh, require further exploration. Of course, the most difficult to me, the most uh, important part is, have you made any attempt to link some of these issues to your own personal, not necessarily private, your own personal experience? You say you haven't done it. It's just foreign culture subject. Well, that's the wrong, that's the wrong division. But you, you need to challenge it. You need to challenge the material and you need to be challenged by the material. The issue we want to explore today is a simple question, sincerity. Now, the word sincerity in Chinese, I should have written it. in Chinese is chen. This word is divided into two parts. This part actually simply means the word. This part actually means completion. So the method we use is a simple English word, sincerity, and trying to capture this concept. Let's say first is a translation. This word chen, C-H-E-N-G, in uh, pinyin, C-H apostrophe E-N-G, in terms of Wei Jiaos. What is Chen? Some of you may have already uh, read, my, uh, read my account, which was written in 1974, published in 1976. And I'm I, of course, accept some of the assertions I made, but I have some new ideas and critical of some of the other observations I made. The word sincere, to be sincere, or sincerity in English means basically two things. Not affected or feigned, therefore genuine. Genuine in the sense of a sincere indignation, which is very genuine unhappiness or moral indignation. The other one is being without hypocrisy or pretense say, this, this is my sincere friend, actually means true friend. So to be sincere means to be genuine or to be true. But this is also an old English use of this term in old English, which means pure or unadulterated. For example, you can even say this is a sincere bottle of wine, unadulterated. But how do we use the simple English word, which is more in the general sense of being honest, being genuine, being true, to capture a major Confucian idea in the Confucian tradition, a major virtue? As you will notice later, that this major virtue is not only psychologically significant, it's a sociologically significant, even cosmologically significant. How do we capture that? One thing seems obvious if we look at the Chinese conception of chen as opposed to the English word sincere, that a Chinese word can be used as a verb. The English word cannot be used as a verb. I don't know how do you turn sincerity into a verb. And also, the Chinese word chen carries, like the English word sincerity, the idea of truth and the idea of genuineness, maybe even authenticity. But one idea 
that is missing in the, in the English word, is very, very important in the Chinese conception of Chen, is the word reality. We need to know a little bit about that, reality. Chen in the Chinese word carries a sense of weightedness, uh, substantive presence, reality. But reality, in a sense, you remember that uh, a couple of weeks ago I tried to convey the mention idea, Mencius idea about stages of human progression, the stages of human flourishing, from being simply a desirable person to a true person, to a beautiful person, to a great person, to a sagely person, to a divine person. So the person who is true is a person who has internal resources. Chen, in this sense, also carries the idea of some content, inner quality, which does not, the idea is not conveyed in sincerity. So in other words, a person who is Chen in this case, or if we broaden the English word being sincere in the Confucian sense, is a person who has inner strength inner resources. So this person has quality, quality of life. But quality, or say in the English word sincere, is a state of being. I'm being sincere. This is sincere indignation. It's a state of being. But the Chinese word chen may be linked to the etymological meaning of this part of it, completion, it's not only a state of being, but a dynamic process. That's the reason why it's important to remember the Chinese word can always be used as a verb. So in other words, you become continuously refined in your chen, in your sincerity. Different degrees of being sincere. And it's a movement. Therefore, implicit in this idea is a sense of activity. I would even say there is moral creativity. This should become clear later, maybe a, just, just a phrase here now. It's a form of moral creativity. The assumption is this. If you obtain something, including the true meaning of an idea, then you get, get it yourself. If you get it yourself, it is no longer an idea. It has some potency, some creative energy, some potency. And the potency will help you to transform yourself. Remember, we have this uh, biblical phrase, truth can make you free or can make us free. What does that mean? Now, we know one form of truth, which does not necessarily make us, make us free. Two plus two is four. 2 plus 2 are 4. Now, this kind of mathematical calculation is to uh, all kinds of empirical knowledge is like that. We know it. That's true. We call it propositional truth. And yet to know that particular kind of truth does not necessarily transform ourselves in any way. But why truth can make us free? Well, another type of truth, for example, if I do believe that my true nature, my true self, is not or ought not to be the slave of my passions, especially anger. I've been angry all the time, but I ask myself I should be better than simply continue to be an angry person. My true self is better than that. This is also a form of truth, form of understanding of my inner self. But that understanding necessarily transforms myself. It is not simply an understanding out there, because it is predicated on my belief that I can overcome my anger. Not indefinitely, but at least some of these reasons that cause my anger. So I'm in the process of becoming the master of my own house. I exercise both from the Xunzian point of view, the cognitive function of the mind. In other words, knowing capacity of the mind, I should become better. Or the mentioned idea 
of trying to search for my heart, which has been lost for some time, to get it back, allow my heart to be in control of my body, therefore in control, become the master of my house. And my true self, as my heart and mind, is not in control. To use another mentioning idea is try to fix the relationship between the great body and the small body in terms of my own experience. To try to find the proper relationship between the great body, that's the body that makes me great, which is my heart and mind. You can even say it is a silent illumination. My conscience, silent illumination, that will help me to become greater than what I am. And all these notions are linked to the Confucian idea of being sincere, being chen. Being sincere is to being in touch with the true self, which is the true reality of my existence. Now, the Confucians argue this way because they believe this is not proved. This is an articulation of faith that our true nature, the nature of being human, the true nature is actually endowed by heaven. It's conferred by heaven, comes directly from heaven. That's a deeper sense of the self. That's my nature, human nature. And this, of course, is very compatible with the Christian idea, even though the Christians talk about the original sin, but this is the idea that Divinity is a defining characteristic of being human. Every human being is endowed with some form of divinity because we are created in the image of God. This reminds me of a very interesting anecdote. It's uh, on campus, so it's useful. After the construction of uh, Emerson Hall, that's where the philosophy department is, the two groups of people say, we, we're going to honor this great American philosopher, Emerson. What should we do? We should try to use uh, uh, a dictum, a motto, a statement to honor him. Two proposals were made. One proposal is the Greek idea, man is the measure of all things. This is probably a very good way of defining what Emerson was all about. Another group of people insisted a statement from the Bible, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Of course, the answer is, since man is in, made in the major, uh, image of God, we should respect him. Finally, the group uh, who advocated the biblical idea won the argument. So now if you walk across campus, if you go to Emerson Hall, there's a statement, very long statement, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Instead of Man is the measure of all things. Now, these two statements indicate two very different orientations. One is Emerson as a profound religious thinker. The other one is Emerson is a humanist. These two statements are very helpful for us to understand where Confucian humanism really stands. Confucian humanism is inclusive. I've used that expression time and time, time again. It's not exclusive. So humanism is not pitted against nature on the one hand, spiritualism on the other. It doesn't slight, nor does it ignore, or uh, it doesn't ignore, nor does it slight the idea of the transcendent. Heaven is very important. So Confucian humanism is inclusive. In this sense, we have the problem often raised in your sections and in, in the general discussion, is Confucianism a religion? It is not a religion because it's not an organized religion. There's no priesthood. There's no idea of uh, the transcendent God. There's no idea of salvation. In that sense, it is not a religion. But there is a profound religious dimension to Confucian humanism because it's very different from the kind of humanism that evolved in recent centuries, especially in the West. We call it secular humanism. Now, the first uh, interpretive account of Confucius we assign in this course is to regard the secular as sacred. 
if you regard the secular as sacred, the idea of being spiritual becomes not only meaningful to, but vitally important for the Confucian project. In this sense, being sincere is not only a psychological state of being honest, being true, hopefully one will be an authentic person, you know, in the modern existentialist sense of the term. It is also a religious truth. Chen, sincerity, is also a transcendent truth. This should become clear as we continue. In fact, we see three arenas in the modern academy. They are all uh, separate, joined in some very interesting integrated fashion in this endeavor. One is the psychological problem, the psychological experience of being sincere. The second one is the sociological question, the sociological question of sociological reality. The third one is the religious question, religious truth. Sincerity in this connection is not only a psychological state, it can become a sociological reality and it is a religious truth. Now, how can we argue that way? How can they be linked in this particular manner? We need to look at the background. The basic background is the Confucian belief in the cosmic order. The belief is that an understanding of the consistent, enduring, and dynamic process of heaven or the cosmic order as a great transformation is the background for our understanding of the idea of sincerity at the human psychological level. The, the assumption is there's underlying meaning in the whole evolutionary process. The cosmos comes into being not because there's a divine will somewhere creating it. The, the, cos, uh, the cosmic process in its evolutionary process that eventually lead to the formation of the human species, that whole process is a process of the unfolding of reality in the sense that the course of heaven, the course of heaven, meaning the process that heaven continues, is a vigorous one. In other words, as a ceaseless process of creative transformation, heaven is never double-minded. In, in other words, the assumption is that the consistency the persistent transformation of heaven indicates there's a spirit of continuous transformation. And that spirit is not double-minded. In other words, that, that spirit is genuine, is true, and is real. Therefore, the existing, the existing human form from the evolutionary process, you know, thousands, thousands, millions, millions of years that came into being, it's a meaningful form of life. Meaningful form of life meaning it's not simply the transformation of nature. It carries a deep message. And that deep message is not predicated. This is quite unique in uh, comparative civilizational studies. It's not predicated on whether we understand why we were created, why the universe came into being. The Confucians were not that much bothered by the question of why. Through what kind of genetic, I mean historical or evolutionary process that we came into being. They were not bothered by that. They're much more concerned about what it is that we call the form of life, which is human. What is the meaning of being human here and now? Not how it actually came into being. Now the question is this may have come into being because of Big Bang. It may have come into being because of steady state. It may come, have come into being because of some kind of creative force behind it. It may come into being because of the natural process. But 
the very fact it is there, it is our form of life, we need to understand it. So the question of what is being human is not a question simply about origins, but it's about the structural elements of being human. Now, methodologically, it needs a little bit of elucidation. You know, many people involved in the study of chemistry and science and physics and so forth, they normally ask, they normally are concerned with three questions. First, how this particular problem came into being? Why this, this is such a problem? This look for the his, historical reasons, why this problem is important, why we, why we want to study it at this juncture, how the problem came into being, it's the first question. The second question is, how is this problem linked with other problems? We call the boundary issues, how it's linked to other problems. The third question is, what is this problem? What is this problem? They, are, they, are, they can be separate. The first is, how the problem came into being, Second one is, how is this problem linked to other problems? Third one is, what is this problem? Now, for all the physicists or chemists or biologists, they're not very much worried about how the problem came into being, unless you become historians of science. Otherwise, you don't ask those questions. You're not that much focused upon the boundary issues because you will not be able to do your work well if you're always worried how this problem is linked to many other problems. You need to solve this problem here now as it presents itself. This is also the Confucian mode of thinking. Human beings came into being through a very, very complicated process. The question of being human is linked to many other problems. But what is the essential element of being human? That's the problem itself. So our form of life, our culture, which means inclusively our civilization, first of all, is not a dream. Unlike the Taoists, the Taoists say it may have been a dream. The Confucian said, no, it's not a dream. It is not an accident. Suddenly, someone somewhere decided this be the case. It's not an accident. It is a form of reality. And it is profoundly meaningful for us. This form of reality, the Confucians use the term chen, sincerity, to capture it. That's the meaning of being sincere. Because our form of life is the result of a joint venture, of a cumulative effort, and a collaborative enterprise. It comes into being not because our own will, because numerous people of our species have contributed. Of course, they're also destroyers, they're destructive forces. But the very fact we're still alive we, still, we can still continue this line, this major biological line, latent with all kinds of ethical religious implications, indicates this form of life is worth continuing. But there's also a sense of precariousness. I, I characterize it as the precarious condition, the precariousness of the human condition. Because there's also the awareness to destroy is easy, to build is painfully difficult, to discontinue is easy, to continue is painfully difficult, to lose is easy, to preserve is painfully difficult. So there's a sense, Chen, the, uh, the idea of sincerity, always carries a sense of apprehension. It's related to, to be true, to be sincere, is also to be cautious. To take part in this joint venture, this cumulative effort and collaborative enterprise, is not to become a superhuman being, not to become superhuman, but to become authentically, truthfully, and really human. You can even say humanity in its all-embracing fullness. The most comprehensive manifestation of humanity. So Chen, the idea of sincerity, this now we move way beyond the English word, sincerity will be able to accommodate. The word Chen actually indicates humanity in its all embracing fullness, the most genuine, authentic, real manifestation of humanity. 
The paradox, again, it's an important Confucian paradox, is uh, if we try to live our ordinary daily life fully, we are ready, we are, in fact, involved in this creative process. It's not important for us to find certain kind of heroic way of demonstrating our humanity. It's not important to find a spiritual sanctuary outside of the world here and now. If we just live our ordinary daily life fully, we already take part in the continuation and flourishing of this particular form of life. And in fact, we take part in this process, not only as human beings, but even as uh, co-creators of the universe. I want to uh, call your attention to one very interesting statement, very short statement, interesting statement in the, analog, uh, in the uh, Doctrine of the Mean. It's uh, 26.9. Let me read it and then give uh, a little bit of uh, explanation. The heaven now before us, meaning the sky, now before us, is only this bright, shiny mass. But when viewed in its unlimited extent, the sun, moon, stars, and constellations are suspended in it, and all things are covered by it. The earth before us is but a handful of soil, but in its breadth and depth, it sustains mountains like Hua and Yue, these are two great mountains in China, without feeding their weight, contains the rivers and seas without letting them leak away, and sustains all things. The mountain before us is only a fistful of straw, but in all the vastness of its size, grass and trees grow upon it, birds and beasts dwell on it, and stores of precious things are discovered in it. The water before us is but a spoonful of liquid, but in all its unfathomable depth, the monsters, dragons, fishes, and turtles are produced in them, and wealth becomes abundant because of it. Now, this simple statement refers to very common experiences of the sky. If you look out of the sky, this is just that shiny mass. But in the vastness of the sky, it covers everything. If we look at the earth in front of us, just this little bit of dirt. But in its full manifestation, the whole earth it's able to carry great mountains. If we look at water in front of me, just a spoonful of liquid, but in the full extent of waterliness or waterness, it is uh, like ocean. Now, if you look at a human being in terms of ordinary human existence, it is very, it's just that able to do a little bit of this and that. But the assumption is, if you do that sincere, in a sincere spirit, in a truthful manner, the full human potential is also unlimited, totally unlimited. Like the dirt, like the liquid, like the shiny mass, like the mountain. The sense is greatness is not based upon simply quantity, based upon some extraordinary feature. Greatness is based upon the cumulative effort, the collaborative enterprise of the human endeavor. Now, how is this uh, ideal sincerity related to other cardinal virtues, important cardinal virtues in Confucian humanism? How is it related to the idea of humanity? which is considered as perhaps the most important Confucian idea. Now, sincerity in this sense means humanity in abundance, this overflow of humanity. The sincere person embodies humanity and cultivates humanity in such a way that humanity, like liquid, is no longer just a spoonful, it overflows. Sincerity Chen entails enlightenment, entails the, the silent illumination. There's the argument that if you become bright, you may want to cultivate your sincerity. 
If your sincerity is fully cultivated, you are necessarily bright. Now, in English, it doesn't work that well. But the notion of Chen is that to be sincere is not simply to be genuine without critical understanding. There's a critical appreciation of why I have to be genuine, I have to be truthful. So the critical uh, faculty is never lost. So in this sense, sincerity is linked to wisdom. It's linked to an idea of enlightenment. But a sincere person always find the most appropriate sense of direction. Therefore, a sincere person is closely linked to a sense of rightness. A sincere person also has the right sense of expressing his inner self. And that right sense is not at all incompatible with the notion of propriety. And a sincere person is reliable, is dependable, predictable, and of course, consistent. In this sense, a sincere person is truthful. So sincerity, even though a term that was not developed in the Analects, only mentioned in passing in Mencius, it became a major thesis in the doctrine of the mean, and it links to all these major cardinal virtues. What are the implications? The implications is that the highest Confucian ideal, the highest Confucian ideal to be human, is not simply understood in terms of the anthropological project, in the sense being human is totally self-sufficient. The highest ideal of being human in the Confucian tradition is to realize the unity between humanity and heaven. The unity of humanity and heaven. Therefore, the unity of the human world on the one hand and the transcendent world of heaven. But heaven is never the radical otherness, never the holy other, never so distant, there's no way that we can appreciate or understand it. Heaven doesn't have a secret project, certain, certain plane that human ra rationality can never comprehend. The assumption is that we, through our own self-understanding, can understand not only other, hum other human beings, but also can understand heaven. This, uh, but even though we understand heaven, you can say heaven's truth is embodied in our own human nature. Human effort is still absolutely necessary for self-transformation. So I want to make a distinction, which is easy to understand, I guess, but uh, if you get into a kind of philosophical discussion, it can be extremely complex. The distinction I want to make is between an ontological assertion and an, an, an existential consideration. When I use the word ontological, which is a big word in, uh, in philosophy, which means what is the true reality? What is the true nature? What it is, what is it in its original true sense of the term? This is ontological. So there's ontological assertion about being human. Since our nature is being confirmed by heaven. So inherent in our nature is the authentic capacity of the human to not only realize himself or herself, but to link the human with heaven. So not that our human rationality always fails to understand what heaven is going to do or what the heaven's project is. It's that the code, the secret code of heaven is already entrusted to our nature. So we look within, if we look within, we'll be able to discover that secret code of heaven. Remember a very important statement in, in the in Mencius that if we fully realize the potential of our heart and mind, that we understand our nature. If we understand our nature, meaning our human nature, then we understand heaven. So because heaven already has given us the secret code, so we can decode 
the secretness of heaven or the truth of heaven through our self-understanding. That is an ontological assertion, which seems it's universal. Every human being is endowed with that capacity, whether of the sage king, Sun, or ordinary uh, common human beings like us. Each one of us has this privileged access to the divine. We don't have to rely upon anything else external to do that. This is an ontological assertion. But existentially, meaning that in our ordinary daily existence, in our common ordinary existence, we have to take into consideration all the constraints, all the environmental conditions, all the internal inhibitions, all the problems that we are confronted with on a daily basis that in some way inhibit us from understanding our inner voice, our inner truth, or our inner illumination, or silent illumination. So this existential condition is such that we have to exert effort. We have to exert effort in order to transform ourselves. So the charge, in this sense, I've already written, written about this in some other context, the charge is how do we as human beings make ourselves deserving partners of heaven? We are heaven's partners because we're co-creators. How can we, how can we cultivate, cultivate ourselves so we become deserving partners? We must be constantly in touch with the silent illumination that makes the rightness of the principle in our heart and mind shine forth brilliantly in the sense that we need to be in touch with our true self, with the truth, the chen, with the truth inherent in our nature. Often we can go on and live the ordinary life without ever in touch with the true reality of our being. It's the silent illumination. But if we activate it, conscientiously activate it, allow it to be a presence of our ordinary existence, it will have tremendous transformative power. If we cannot go beyond the constraints of our environment, our egoism, our nepotism, our parochialism, even our ethnocentrism or nationalistic chauvinism, the most we can hope for is a kind of exclusive, closed, idea of the self, which is like the liquid which is confined to a cup. So it's only a spoonful of liquid. The earth, the dirt that is confined to simply a handful. Not the extensiveness that it should be that would be able to uh, cover a lot of ground. Now, Chen, in this sense, then, is humanity in its all-embracing fullness. And it can actually form one body, form one body with uh, heaven, with earth, and a myriad of things. Self-realization is, is a form of self-transformation. And that, that transformation is a process which enables us to embody an ever-extending network of relationships. Almost like the earth that is extended to become the mountain, to become the earth itself, or the liquid that is expanded to become the ocean. And that expansion is not based upon any extra rules and regulations, simply based upon the chen, the inner truth that we, um, each one of us embodies as a gift of heaven. Heaven is, everybody is confirmed by heaven to have it. I have a quote here, um, which is a bit long, but I think uh, give you a sense of how this move from psychology to a kind of religious truth. Absolute sincerity, sincerity or absolute chen, absolute sincerity is ceaseless. It's not a state of being alone, it is a process. It's ceaseless. Being ceaseless, it is lasting. Being lasting, it is evident. Being evident, it is infinite. Being infinite, it is extensive and deep. 
Being extensive and deep, it is high and brilliant. It is because it is extensive and deep that it contains all things. It is because it is high and brilliant that it overshadows all things. It is because it is infinite and lasting that it can complete all things. In being extensive and deep, it is the counterpart of earth. In being high and brilliant, it is the counterpart of heaven. In being infinite and lasting, it is unlimited. Such being its nature, it becomes prominent without any display, produces changes without motion, and accomplishes its aims without action. What we have here about earth, about heaven, is a very, or I would say a very profound religious statement about human reality as the embodiment of ten, embodiment of sincerity. So what is being stated in that context is uh, in a way a blueprint for human being to form a trinity with heaven and earth. Now the statement I've quoted here uh, for your benefit, chapter 22, if it is read out of context, it sounds funny. Uh, almost, you have, you have no way of linking it with your own personal experience. What is, what is it talking about? But if you put in the broader context, what I just outlined, this statement actually has a special meaning in defining what true humanity ought to be. Only those who are absolutely sincere can fully realize their own nature. This is a statement about ontological reality. But in the actual process of doing it, of course, it is a very complicated procedure. Only those who are absolutely sincere can fully realize their own nature. If they can fully realize their own nature, they can fully realize human nature. If they can fully realize human nature, they can fully realize the nature of things. If they can fully realize the nature of things, they can participate in the transforming and nourishing process of heaven and earth. If they can participate in the transforming and nourishing process of heaven and earth, they can then form a trinity with heaven and earth. The easy way to understand it in, from an ecological point of view is that precisely every human being has that potential, not to mention humanity collectively, human beings can also become major destroyers. It, it is in this sense we call the human, human beings our co-creators. Not only their co-creators, potential, their, their destructive power potentially is also, also infinite. So this conception of the human makes this uh, clear that human beings ought to be responsible members, not only of their own species, but uh, of the cosmic process as a whole. Uh, I have a couple of questions, couple of minutes. I don't know any any of you have any questions. <laughs>